Uh, yeah. Uh, family, y'all. Just keep it tight, keep it tight, keep it tight. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Here we go, here we go. Uh. The next section is on Christian life. The question is, what was it like to be a Christian back during those centuries? So the majority of Christians, were the majority of Christians wealthy? No, the majority of Christians were the 99%, right? In fact, the majority of Christians were, came from the lower echelons of society, says Dr. Gonzalez. What, what impact is that going to have on the church? You know, if you're a church of very learned, wealthy, educated people, that's one thing. What happens if you're a church of the poor and the uneducated? It's going to be a different church. Which was our church? We were the church of, of the lower echelons of society, says Dr. Gonzalez. And so the miraculous and even ridiculous played a role in legends and in apocryphal writings. Right? That a feather dropped from the angel Gabriel's wing and touched Mary's stomach and that's what made her pregnant? You know what? For poor uneducated people, that sounds like a plausible story. Right? For scholars and people who study biology, you know, our biology classes don't necessarily include the warning that you need to avoid falling feathers, right? But back in that time, I mean, it was people who were believing these sorts of miraculous and ridiculous things. The apocryphal scriptures were many of those, those stories of Jesus and of the early church that were written with things that people couldn't believe. You know, the uh, Dr. Gonzalez shares, you know, one apocryphal text about was that the baby Jesus, you know, or the, the child Jesus is playing and is destroying various vases, but then, you know, does different things to build up those vases and fill them with water. Sort of like, you know, these are things, the stories. Remember Celsus last time? The last time he was talking about how it was that, that the Christians are like telling stories in the same way that cobblers and tanners and women tell stories? Remember that? So that, that, was, that was pretty... He had some pretty harsh words to say about Christians. But essentially, some of these stories that we as Christians were sharing at that time were the object of ridicule by others. How can they believe these things? At that time, Christian art evolved. Why was Christian art so important? Because as illiterate people, could we read? We couldn't read. And we didn't have books back then. There was no printing press. And so what was one way in which we could share our faith? <clears throat> By painting certain things. If we're going to meet to pray at, in the catacombs or in the, the tombs, right, then we start to decorate it with some of our Christian images. So when others look at it and ask, Mommy, what is that? Oh, we can share what that is. Which is why art in many churches is still important, right? We can take a look at various paintings or various stained glass windows and, and share those stories with those who are looking at them. Or in our children's liturgy of the word, right? You can share a coloring book or an image or a picture or something with someone, and that becomes a simple way of teaching them. The symbol of the fish, ichthyus. Have we heard that before? We've seen the symbol of the fish before, at the early Christian symbol of the fish. How it was that it's actually, the, the Greek word for fish, ichthyus, was actually used as an, acro an, an acrostic, meaning where the first letter J, they had no J in Greek, so the I was for the word for Jesus. Christ comes after that. Son of God, a Savior. Sort of like the Greek word for fish became an acrostic. Every letter of the word fish became a symbol of who Jesus was. Worship, how interesting that when we gathered to worship, that brought together people of all different classes. When did we worship? We worshiped on Sundays. So every Sunday we gathered to celebrate the resurrection of the Lord. We talked about that, right? Every Sunday we'd gather at sunrise to watch the sun come up in the east and to be able to celebrate the, the rising of the light of Christ, Christ rising from the dead. But then we had one annual celebration at which we baptized people into faith. That was our annual celebration of the resurrection. We called it Easter. In order to prepare to be baptized, there should be some preparation for baptism. We call those weeks of preparing for baptism Lent. Interesting. So for the first time, we still don't have a Christmas at this time in our history, but the first things we're celebrating is we're celebrating every Sunday, and we're celebrating a yearly Easter with a yearly time of preparation that we, call, that we now call Lent. Our celebrations were twofold. We had the Liturgy of the Word, and then after that, the Liturgy of the Eucharist. 
interesting. So we had two different, two different parts to our service. First, we celebrate the Word. We hear God's Word, and we hear the, the preaching on that Word. And then after that, we break bread together. How interesting that during the Word, our catechumens can be present during the Word. They can hear the Word. But after that, we dismiss the catechumens. They all go off with Raphaela, who's going to teach them, while the rest of us celebrate the Eucharist. Interesting. And what came between the two of them? A kiss of peace. Think about it for a moment. In the Roman Catholic Church, the sign of peace comes later. Where does the sign of peace come from? The American Catholic Church? It comes between the two. Why between the two? Why would a person put it between the two? Oh, wait a minute. That's actually what the ancient church was doing. Why? I mean, the ancient church saw it as the symbol of, okay, we hear the word proclaimed, we hear how it is that Jesus tells us we have to love and forgive and live in peace with one another, we read in the scripture how it is that we need to, before bringing our sacrifice to the altar, we need to go and make peace with one another, okay? Before we bring our gifts to the altar, we need to make peace with one another. That was the tradition of the ancient church. The community often celebrated death anniversaries in the catacombs. So if we know that Angelita was a holy person who was a confessor of the faith, she didn't die a martyr, but she was a confessor of the faith, well, every year when her death anniversary comes around, what are we going to do? We're going to remember her in a special way. Let's go to her tomb and let's have a special mass, a special celebration of her life. Okay. Were our celebrations marked by sorrow and repentance? No, I mean, it wasn't this, I have sinned, I have sinned, I'm a terrible person. It was, they were marked by joy and gratitude. The bishop's fragmentum, interesting. Think about this symbol for a moment. As we grew... Right? We started living in cities where not everyone in Austin could come together in one church at the same time, so we had different churches. Okay, what do you do with, if, if we have different churches? How do we express our unity? What would happen is when the bishop broke the bread, he would send a piece of that bread out to every church. Hmm. Interesting symbol. So, all the different churches, we need to designate, okay, it's your turn this week, Terry, thank you. It's your turn this week to go down to the cathedral church and to get the piece of bread that the bishop's going to give for Holy Family. Okay? So different people are going to take the pieces, the fragmentum, a fragment of the bread that the bishop celebrates to bring it to our church. What, what part of our Mass today do we still have that reflects that? I don't know if you ever noticed it, but during the Mass, when we have the breaking of the bread, during the Lamb of God, we're all seeing the Lamb of God, we see the deacons going off and bringing the body of Christ from the tabernacle. We see the pouring of the wine into different uh, chalices. What we may not see is that, that the celebrant, after breaking the bread, takes a very small piece. And the reason that, I, that, for me, it's like a very, very teeny tiny piece, only because what happens is many, many priests or bishops have, like, have a larger piece. Like if there's a piece of bread the size of your fingernail, right, that they put into the, into the chalice. But what happens is when people like grab the chalice, they're like, Ooh, whose back wash is that? Right? Like, you know, so that's why I tend not to have such a big piece, but that, that is symbolic of the fragmentum, which was sent out to the various churches, right? That, that symbol, even today, after I break the bread, I take a piece and of that bread, and it goes into the cup. It's a symbol of that ancient, that ancient symbol of our community, our communion, our unity with the bishop and with all of the churches. Baptisms were, done, were, supposed, were to be done in living water. Living water was a, an expression of, of running water. So, you know, a lake, a river, you know, water that flows. That's the best symbol for baptisms. But what if water is scarce? If you're out in the middle of the desert and you don't have a river flowing through it, well, if you have some container of water, then, then you can baptize a person by pouring three times instead. Ooh, have you seen people baptized like that? Where does that trace its roots to? Back at this time period. The ideal is to do it in living water, in water that's flowing. But if you can't do that, well then, if water is scarce, then pour water three times over a person, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Three principal ministries evolved. So, back in the beginning of the church, we didn't have popes and cardinals and archbishops and the like. In the beginning of the church, we had, first we had these deacons, these people who served the needs of those who were not being served. After that, we had the overseers of the community, the bishops, the episcopoi, the overseers. And then the presbyters were the elders, 
And he, eventually, those three would evolve to be sort of like the three principal ministries in the church. That we would have deacons, we would have elders, presbyters, and we would have bishops. By the end of the second century, sadly, women were beginning to be excluded from leadership in the church. If we read scripture, there's all sorts of passages that talk about the involvement of women in the early church. By the end of the second century, already, women were beginning to be excluded. Not formally excluded yet, but they were beginning to be excluded. But we would allow women to play a, a very important role in the church as widows and later as virgins, which simply means what? Here we have these widows. So what do we do now if a person is widowed, right? If a person has lost her husband and her children or other family members, I mean, if she were to remarry, if she remarries a person who's not a Christian, poor her. Or if her children are not Christian, poor her. We need to make sure that she's taken care of so that she doesn't have to go back to non-Christian children or to a non-Christian husband. Follow me? And so the way that we did that was by taking care of our widows. She is a good Christian. We don't want her having to go back and rely on a new pagan husband or on her pagan children. So better for us to find ways to take care of our widows. Interesting. And the widows, in turn, provided very important roles within the community. Roles of teaching, for instance. Roles of praying for our needs and the needs of the church. I mean, widows were important. Later, we would admit virgins as well. How interesting that this model of widows and virgins today in the church, what do we know them as? Nuns. Do we allow nuns to be ordained in the Roman Catholic Church, right? Are nuns ordained? No, but they're eventually, essentially following in the footsteps of the, the widows and the virgins of the church, this group of second class, if we, can, if we dare say that, of second class women whom we will not ordain, but we would like to acknowledge that your ministry is important and we love you. Thank God for the American Catholic Church where we don't have second class citizens like that, right? Where ministry is open where you don't have to be a widow or a virgin or a nun to serve the church, if you're a woman. Well, I have a couple of uh, comments. One is uh, regarding the, this is, I think, the place where on um, 2B, it says the community often celebrated death anniversaries in the catacombs. Mm -hmm. I think this is where the, the author points out that the church didn't own property. Mm -hmm. And so they couldn't like go to a oh, to the does, church. Doesn't that apply? <laughs> uh, they, they couldn't go to the church property Anymore. because they didn't have any. And yet, if you the family could own uh, like a funeral plot or your own That's space for your deceased bodies, and there they would invite others to celebrate. Mm -hmm. And that's how they would um, come together. And we recall that Gonzalez talks about how it was that we formed funeral societies. Think about the Roman. As a church, we cannot buy land or purchase tombs in the catacombs. We can't do that as a church. But what if we were a funeral society? Oh, as a funeral society, we could do it. So as a funeral society, we could have this place, which is ours, the Holy Family Funeral Society, right? We have our own place to be able to worship, where we have, where, where for instance, we have the remains of Angelita, who was a confessor of the faith. Here we are in the presence of Angelita and all who have gone before us. Think of how powerful that would have been. And all my sacred bones. And all your sacred bones. <laughs> Which, as we're going to see in a few more centuries, I mean, her bones are going to become important. Because just imagine, for, for instance, if we were to have a piece of her bone. A relic? A relic. A piece of her bone, or even something that touched her bone. We're going to start talking about different classes of relics, right? A first class, class relic is going to be a piece of her body. Second class relic, something that touched a piece of her. So that if we take her bone and rub it on a piece of cloth and cut that cloth into various pieces and circulate those out into various places, then we have various relics. 
And think about it for a moment. So the renewed theology, at the beginning of Mass, I don't know if you've ever noticed, the beginning of Mass and the end of Mass, we kiss the altar. It's a sign of reverencing the altar, which is a symbol of Christ, that we reverence this piece of furniture, this altar on which we celebrate the Eucharist. But what happened once we started taking pieces of Angelita's bone, we started putting them into our altars, here at San, Santa Angelita Catholic Church, we have, a, we have a relic of Angelita in the altar, so that now the perception becomes, it's not reverencing the altar, it's reverencing the An, Angelita's relic. Interesting, this is going to become fascinating in subsequent centuries. What, what are Father Jamie and Deacon Roy and Deacon Cleovis and Deacon John kissing when they kiss the altar? Before, they were kissing the relic of St. Angelita, or whichever saint was in that altar. Since the 1960s, we returned to the ancient practice of reverencing the piece of furniture on which we celebrate the Eucharist, reverencing the altar, a symbol of Christ. I had another comment that uh -huh. was interesting to me that, um, it, if I'm not mistaken, this is the area where in uh, 2D it talks about, the author talks about the baptism that were done at the time, and, and um, there was a, a segregation, basically. The women were on one side and the men were on the other. And there was Why? This, <laughs> there was this curtain in between because at some point, and this is what my question is, where did it say that you had to get undressed to be baptized in water? But that's what happened. So we were getting undressed. We, we were being baptized naked, which is why, guys, guys and girls, you know, we had to have our own separate baptizing quarters here. Let's put a curtain down in the river there so that, so that the deaconesses can baptize the women and the deacons can baptize the boys. So that they don't see, where's all that coming from? How, how much clothes were you born with? Oh, we come, out of the, we come out of the womb naked. What is baptism but a rebirth? Interesting. So that we're baptized in the same way that we came into this world, right? We're reborn rebirthed again, and then clothed in white. Interesting. So in many infant baptisms in some churches, and it's a very beautiful sign, the infants are still baptized naked. How they came forth from the womb, how they're reborn. Interesting. As Americans, because we're so influenced by so many conservative uh, notions historically, it's difficult for us to imagine. In many Eastern countries, eh, it's how we celebrate baptism. Well, Father, you know, that's what I guess I'm questioning because Jesus didn't get undressed to be baptized. He did not? No. He didn't? So, is that in Scripture or like what? Well, I, I just, I've mm -hmm. never read that. I've never read that he had clothes on. The picture showed him. <laughs> the picture <laughs> showed him clothes on, right? <laughs> so an interesting question. Well, I mean, the baptism, mm -hmm. the whole concept of baptism comes from the time that Christ was baptized. Get there you on. go. There you go. So if scripture, scripture does not say one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Scripture says Jesus came up out of the water. It doesn't say whether he came up in his loincloth or whether he came up in his birthday suit. Hmm. Interesting. And most certainly John was the baptizer. He was not saying, okay, women on this side, men on this side. We, we have no record of that. We have no record of that. So interesting, but in the early church we have this record of how it was that women were separated from men. And why, according to the, to the documents that are left us, because of how we were dressing or not for baptism. We... So is there any record of how Jesus was dressed during the baptism? No, there are only our own interpretations of that and the art that we see. And because we've seen so many images of Jesus coming up out of the water dressed in so many different ways, it's difficult for us to imagine things in a different way. It doesn't fit with what we've seen and experienced. And they probably did not show a picture of Jesus naked because that flesh means sin. So, so therefore, if Jesus bad. died on the cross, so I mean, there was the, the, the in the Hebrew scripture talked about how it was that the Messiah was was essentially crucified naked. Are we going to have naked images of Christ on the cross in our churches? I mean, we as Americans tend to be more 
more conservative, more Puritan in our roots. Cover him up. Yeah. <laughs> Another example, yeah, I mean, there are just various examples. For instance, Mary reading, you know, we have different images of, you know, Mary being taught to read. Like, would Mary have been taught to read? I mean, historically, we just have to ask questions about some of the images that we see. As a girl in that time, in that place, would she have learned to read? Mm -hmm. Probably not. Did Jesus read? I mean, we have to ask ourselves certain questions. There is one verse in Scripture, in the Gospel of Luke, that says that Jesus took up the scroll and read. That is the only sentence that suggests that Jesus read. Had, if we were to exclude Luke, we would have no record of Jesus ever reading. Interesting. Which, which brings to mind another question mm -hmm. I had, and that is about the fish. Mm -hmm. And you know Greek, I don't. Mm -hmm. And this, this, talks, this author talks about how the I-C-H-T-H-Y-S is like initials or standing for the words Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. Right. So are, is every letter in the I-C-H-T-H-Y-S uh, a Greek letter that specifically uh, belongs to those words? I've always wondered because the answer is yes. However, for instance, in Gonzalez's translation, he uses the CH, which is the Greek letter chi. I think a more accurate translation of that actually would be the X. If you look up, if we were to Google images of that fish, it would be ichthyos, that's spelled with I-C-H, but I-X. Interesting, because I is for Jesus, or the iota, right? Jesus, Christus, the X. How interesting. But we have, we're going to come back to this. The word, the word that Gonzalez uses is the labarum. What is the labarum? The labarum is often on church vestments or on church designs. We see this symbol. Have we seen that before? It looks like a P with an X on it. Is it a P and an X? It's actually the X is the Greek letter chi. And this is not a P, but it's actually the Greek letter rho. So that Christus in Greek is begins with the chi and the rho. So that's this symbol. The labarum on Constantine's shields. When he's going to go into war then, they're going to have this sign on their shields. It's a symbol of the first two letters of Christ. Ooh, I say the first two letters of Christ. For us in English, it's the first three letters of Christ, C-H-R, the same with what we have here in Gonzalez's translation. He translates it I-C-H. I would be tempted to translate the C-H, rather, it's an X, which I think if you were to Google images of the ichthyos, you'll see more images with the X-I-X. -X. Mm -hmm. Is that where they got that I-H-S from that? Ooh. That is such an excellent question. So the IHS is not IHS. That is such a great insight. See, as, as Americans and as English speakers, we see a P and we see an X, which is really the chi and the rho. So here what we do is we have the Greek letter I, the Greek letter for E, the capital E in Greek looks like an H, and the capital S in Greek. So it's actually in Greek then it would be the first three letters of the name Jesus. Interesting. Christ. Jesus, the I-H-S, are the first three letters in Greek for Jesus. Who would associate a capital H with the letter E? But Jesus, in Greek, would, would have been spelled I, the E, the capital letter for the E would have looked like an H. Excellent question. <laughs>